The 1985 McDonald's All-American team doesn't have many NBA stars, but several players carved out solid careers in college and the pros. That said, there are a few players who, for whatever reason, didn't make the cut in 85. The list of players who didn't make the squad includes three-time All-Star Glenn Rice, one-time All-Star Mookie Blaylock, five-time All-Star Tim Hardaway, 1993 Six Man of the Year and future Survivor contestant Clifford Robinson, three-time champ BJ Armstrong, and European star Vlade Divac, among many others. But those guys didn't make the list, so let's take a look at what happened to every McDonald's All-American player from the 85 squad. Steve Bucknell. Bucknell started his basketball career playing at Crystal Palace Basketball Club in London before moving to the States to attend Governor Dummer Academy in Massachusetts. He would start for the squad and go on to attend North Carolina for college ball. The 6'6 guard came off the bench during his first two seasons, but was made a starter during his final two years. Playing alongside Rick Fox and a player we'll get to shortly, Bucknell grew into a double-digit scorer while contributing five assists and four rebounds a night. He went undrafted in 1989 but made the Lakers roster that season, making him the third English-born player to play in the NBA and the first to grow up in the country of his birth. He played in 18 games for LA, averaging just under a point a night before leaving the NBA and playing overseas for several years, winning a title and making several all-star teams in the British League. Bucknell then took up coaching and currently works as the head of talent and performance for Basketball England. Rick Calloway Calloway grew up in Cincinnati but started his college career at Indiana. He became an instant starter and averaged 14 points a night during his first season on campus. The 6'6 forward would continue to be a key cog in the Hoosiers' run to the 1986-87 title but broke his wrist in the national title game. When he came back for his junior season, coach Bob Knight started to cut his minutes and the two would have something of a falling out, culminating in Callaway transferring to Kansas to play under Roy Williams. He sat out one year and then helped guide the Jayhawks to a top five finish in the final AP poll. He went undrafted in 1990 but played quite a bit in the CBA before catching on with the Sacramento. Kings for a season. Callaway only played in 64 games, averaging just over three points before heading overseas to play in Argentina and Poland. The most recent update I've found is that he's working in pool construction in the Houston area. Terry Dozier. If you've been watching these lists, Dozier was the latest in a long line of recruits from Paul Lawrence Dunbar in Baltimore. He would take his talents to South Carolina and become an instant star for the Gamecocks. His best season came as a sophomore when he averaged 17 points and 5 boards, but his averages over 4 seasons were 14 points and 5 rebounds a night. However, that wasn't good enough to be selected in the 1990 draft, though he would eventually sign with the Hornets. He played in 9 games and averaged 2 points before being waived before the calendar rolled over to December. Dozier then joined the NBL and won 3 straight Best Defensive Player awards in the lower league. He'd also spend a year in Israel before wrapping up his playing career. Dozier would then take up coaching back in South Carolina. His nephew PJ Dozier started playing in the NBA in 2017 and signed with the Timberwolves for the 2024 season. It'll take a while before these videos get there, but PJ was also a McDonald's All-American in 2015. Sean Elliott Elliott decided to stay in Tucson and play under Lou Olson at Arizona. During his first season, he was named Pac-10 Freshman of the Year and dropped 16 points and 5 boards a night. Those numbers would grow to 22-7 as a senior when he won several Player of the Year awards. While he wasn't able to win a title with the Wildcats, he did lead the team to a Final Four as a junior. Elliott wrapped up his career as a two-time All-American and two-time Pac-10 Player of the Year. He was selected by the Spurs with the third pick in the NBA Draft, joining David Robinson to help form a young core in San Antonio. By year two, Elliott was a permanent starter, helping the Spurs become a playoff contender. Ninja made his first All-Star team in 93, but was traded to Detroit the next season in a deal that sent Dennis Rodman to the Spurs. At the end of the season, he was traded back to the Spurs in exchange for Bill Curley. With Robinson becoming a league MVP, the Spurs were a legit contender and Elliott made his second All-Star team in 96. However, injuries started to hit the two stars, which eventually led to the team drafting Tim Duncan. In 99, Elliott and Robinson finally won a title, besting the Knicks in five games. Of course, Elliott's most famous moment from that title run was the Memorial Day miracle where he hit a game-winning three-point shot over Rasheed Wallace off of his tiptoes. Soon after the championship win, Elliott discovered he had a kidney disease and had to get a kidney transplant. The next year, he became the first pro athlete to return to his sport after a kidney transplant. He played in several games that year, but the team lost to the Lakers. Elliott retired after the next season and entered the broadcasting world. Purvis Ellison The 6'9 Ellison went to Louisville for college ball and started with a bang. 
As the team's starting center, he helped them to a title in 1986, becoming the second freshman to win the tournament's most outstanding player after dropping 25 points and 11 rebounds to beat Duke. For his steady play in the tournament, fans and media started calling him Never Nervous Purvis. While Louisville didn't win another title, Ellison's game continued to grow, and he was a consensus first-team All-American in 1989. He then jumped to the NBA draft, where he was selected first overall by the Kings. Unfortunately, injuries would quickly start to pile up, leading to teammate Danny Ainge calling him out-of-service Purvis. After only playing in 34 games as a rookie, he was traded to the Bullets in 1990. There, he would finally start to show signs of his potential, averaging 20 points, 11 boards, and nearly 3 blocks in 92 to win the Most Improved Player Award. Sadly, injuries would hit hard once again, and while Ellison played until 2001, he never started more than 30 games after that 93 season. He then started coaching in New Jersey, and his son Malik played at the D1 level for St. John's and Pitt before heading overseas to start his pro career. Danny Ferry Ferry's dad, Bob, played in the NBA during the 60s and then worked as the GM for the Bullets for nearly 20 years, so it wasn't too surprising when the younger Ferry showed an aptitude for the game. Danny went to Duke for his college ball, helping them to three Final Fours during his time with the school. He was a highly decorated college player, winning several Player of the Year awards in 1989 and ending his career as a two-time All-American. He also still holds the record for most points in a game for Duke with 58 against Miami. Ferry was selected second overall by the Clippers in the 89 draft, but didn't want to play with the team, so he played in Italy for a season. Ellie then traded him to the Cavs, where he'd spend the bulk of his career. That said, Ferry's collegiate game never quite translated, partially because of an early knee injury, and he only started 186 of the 917 games of his NBA career. Still, he was a solid bench player for much of his career, even finishing third for most improved player in 96. He then spent a few seasons coming off the bench with the Spurs, winning a title in 2003. He'd retire after that season and join San Antonio's front office. In 2005, he was made the Cavs GM and is, for some, one of the reasons the team failed to build a championship contender around a young LeBron James. He left the team in 2010 and joined the Hawks in 2012. However, he came under fire and was eventually bought out from his position after reading aloud a quote offensive and racist comment made about Luol Deng in a scouting report. Ferry would get back into an executive role with the Pelicans in 2016 but was moved from that position in 2019. He would then join the Spurs as a consultant in 2020 where he is seemingly still working as of 2024. Lowell Hamilton Hamilton was one of the best high school players in Chicago during the mid-80s, leading Providence St. Mel to a state title in 1985. He would then join Illinois to play college ball. During his freshman season, he mostly came off the bench, but his sophomore season saw him start most of the season and he upped his scoring into double figures. However, the next year, Nicky Anderson and Kenny Battle started playing with the team after sitting out the previous year, and Kendall Gill started to come into his own, forcing Hamilton out of the starting lineup. He'd make his way back into the first five as a senior and help the Fighting Illini to the 1989 Final Four. However, he ultimately went undrafted and went overseas to play nine years of pro ball. While there, he took up coaching and was most recently coaching for a private high school in Georgia. Tom Hammonds Hammonds left Florida to attend Georgia Tech. He was named ACC Rookie of the Year as a freshman, averaging 12 points and 6 boards. Those numbers would continue to grow until he was dropping 21 and 8 a night as a senior. Along the way, he picked up two first-team All-ACC nods and was named to the third-team All-American as a senior. Hammonds was then made the ninth pick in the 89 draft by the Bullets. He would never find that same level of success in the NBA, instead plying his trade as a journeyman enforcer for much of his career. Hammonds played for 12 seasons with four different teams, but is probably best remembered for his time in Denver. That's also where he started to fall in love with drag racing. Upon retirement, he would get behind the wheel even more, becoming a relatively accomplished driver in the National Hot Rod Association. Hammonds also took up jiu-jitsu, winning his division at the 2014 Pan Jiu-Jitsu Championships and opened a car dealership in South Carolina. Tito Horford Horford was born in the Dominican Republic but played high school ball in Houston. He originally enrolled at the University of Houston, but was ruled ineligible. The 7-1 star then went to LSU but was kicked off the team. While all this was happening, there were NCAA investigations into whether he was being paid to play. Eventually, Horford would settle at the University of Miami, where he played for two seasons, averaging 14 points, 9 boards, and a little over 2 blocks for his career. He then jumped to the NBA, where he was selected 39th overall by the Bucks in 88, becoming the first Dominican-born player in the league. He came off the bench for two seasons in Milwaukee, and then played overseas before signing with the Bullets for three games in 94. Tito then moved to Michigan, where he started a family. His son Al would also become a basketball player, winning two titles for the Florida Gators and then embarking on a long NBA career that saw him become a five-time All-Star and NBA champion. However, he was not a McDonald's All-American, so take that, Al. Ed Horton 
Horton was part of a loaded 1985 Iowa recruiting class that also included B.J. Armstrong and a guy we'll talk about shortly. He came off the bench as a freshman, but worked his way into the starting lineup as a sophomore. By his senior year, Horton was dropping 18 points and 10 boards a night for the Hawkeyes. For that, he was named the first team all Big Ten squad and was then selected 39th overall by the Bullets in the 89 draft. He then played in 45 games as a rookie and then left to play overseas in the lower leagues until 1997 when he retired. As of 2018, he was living in Iowa running basketball camps for disadvantaged kids and raising his six children. Kip Jones Jones went to Purdue for his college career. During his first two years, he largely came off the bench and only averaged around three points a night. As a junior, he became a starter and bumped that average up to seven points. During his final season, his starts and minutes dropped due to a back injury, but Jones brought his scoring up to nine a night when healthy. He then played overseas for a few years before bopping around for several years in odd jobs and then starting a career as a high school teacher in Indiana. Tony Kimbrough Kimber was a stud forward in Kentucky and regarded as one of the top players in the country. He went to Louisville for college alongside Purvis Ellison and came off the bench as a freshman to help the team win a title. The next year, Kimbrough entered the starting lineup and became a double-digit scorer. However, he'd miss the next season after being declared ineligible. He was solid when he came back, but his game never took that next leap and by his senior year, he'd been surpassed by guys like Felton Spencer and LeBradford Smith. Still, he remains fifth in games played at Louisville. I haven't been able to find out much info about his post-playing career, but his son, Tony Kimbrough Jr., did play basketball for Georgia State in 2012. Walker Lambiot The MVP of the 1985 McDonald's All-American game started his collegiate career at NC State. He largely came off the bench for the Wolfpack during his two seasons there and only mustered five points a night. Lambiot then set out a year after transferring to Northwestern. During his junior year, he started nearly every game and averaged 18 points and five boards a night. Those numbers would dip slightly as a senior, but he remained one of the Wildcats' top options. He went undrafted in 1990 and went overseas to play for three years in Japan. It looks like he's since led a mostly normal life, but it's hard to find much info. Jerome Lane Lane played for St. Vincent St. Mary High School, which would become famous worldwide for another McDonald's All-American in around 2001. However, we aren't talking about the King. The 6'6 Lane went to Pitt to play college ball. He started off as a solid contributor for the Panthers, but then he put on 60 pounds and averaged 16 points and 13.5 rebounds a night as a sophomore, becoming the first 6'6 or shorter player to lead the country in rebounding since 1958. His numbers went down slightly as a junior, but he was still a rebounding machine and shattered a backboard against Providence. He would then head to the NBA. He was selected by the Nuggets with the 23rd pick in the 88 draft and carved out a five-year career in the NBA, mostly coming off the bench, but still bringing in nearly six boards a night. Lane then spent several seasons in the CBA, leading the league in rebounding four times. I haven't been able to find out too much about his post-playing career, but his son Jerome Lane Jr. did spend some time in the NFL as a practice squad player. Jeff Lebo Lebo joined Dean Smith's North Carolina team for college ball and was a double-digit scorer over his four-year career. He made the second-team All-ACC squad as a junior, but his most notable achievements were setting the record for consecutive free throws made at 41 and grabbing 17 assists in a single game. The 6-2 table setter went undrafted in 1989, but signed with the Spurs for the season, appearing in four games. He'd leave his playing days behind and jumped into coaching the next season, and has worked in the college game for the last 40 years, most notably as the head coach at Auburn from 2004 to 2010. As of 2024, he was working as an assistant on former teammate Hubert Davis's staff in North Carolina. Tommy Lewis Lewis started his collegiate career at USC and played well as a freshman, averaging 18 points and four boards a night. I didn't pay the subscription fee to read the article, but from the headline, it looks like he had some trouble with the staff and decided to transfer to Pepperdine after his freshman season. He continued to pour in buckets, averaging 23 points as a sophomore and 18 over his three-year career. Lewis spent a year playing in Portugal before jumping into coaching. He's worked all over the map, even working on Cheryl Miller's staff at two different stops. Most recently, it looks like he's working at a high school in California. Kevin Madden Madden was another McDonald's All-American who signed with North Carolina for college ball. The 6'6 forward was mostly a depth option during his first two seasons, but as a junior his minutes went up and he raised his averages to 15 points and 5 rebounds a night. The next year his numbers dipped off slightly, but he was still a solid player for the Tar Heels. It doesn't look like he played much professionally, but he was working as a high school coach as recently as 2022. Roy Marble I hinted at Marble earlier when I mentioned Iowa star studded 1985 class. The 6'6 guard started for the Hawkeyes for four seasons, averaging double digit points every year. As a senior, he poured in 20 points a night to become the school's all-time leading scorer. He'd hold that record for 32 years until Luke Garza finally broke it. 
Marble was selected with the 23rd pick in the 89 draft by the Hawks. He played in 24 games and then played for three years in the CBA. He'd return to the NBA for five games with the Nuggets in 94 before jumping back to the CBA for a few more seasons and hanging him up. Sadly, in 2014, Marble was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer in his lungs and he passed away the next year. His son Devin would eventually follow him to Iowa and the father-son duo became the first such pair to score a thousand plus Big Ten points each. He then played for a few years in the NBA before spending several years playing overseas. Michael Porter After high school, Porter was supposed to go to Virginia Tech, but couldn't get his grades up to snuff. He played at the JUCO level for a few years before transferring to St. John's in 1987. Alongside fellow JUCO transfer Boo Harvey, Porter played one season for the team before it looks like his basketball career ended. I've been unable to find out anything else about Porter, likely because he shares a name with a very famous modern day player. Pooh Richardson Richardson left Philly to join UCLA and play with Reggie Miller. The 6-1 guard was an instant starter and won Pac-10 Freshman of the Year and averaged double-digit points throughout his four years in LA. He also contributed solid assist numbers and made three first-team All-Pac-10 teams. Richardson was then selected 10th overall by the Timberwolves in 1989, the first draft pick in franchise history. He was named to the All-Rookie team that season and carved out a steady, if unspectacular, 10-year NBA career averaging 11 points and 6.5 assists a night. After retiring, he spent one season playing in Milan for Joe and Kobe Bryant's team before jumping into coaching at the AAU level in California. As of 2024, he was working as an assistant at the College of the Desert Community College. Doug Roth The 6'11 Roth took his talents to Tennessee for his college career. As a freshman, he mostly came off the bench but became an everyday starter as a sophomore. He averaged around 10 points and 7 boards a night, numbers that would hover around that same mark for the rest of his career. The big man was selected with the 41st pick in the 89 draft by the Bullets and appeared in 42 games for the team. He was at best mediocre in his minutes and went head to the CBA and then the German leagues after the season was over. It's worth noting that I read he was legally blind in one of his eyes, so if anyone has any further info, I would be very interested to hear more about that, if it's true. Quinn Snyder Snyder joined Danny Ferry at Duke, but was largely a role player over his four years of college. He averaged six points and four assists over his career and was a steady hand at the point during his junior and senior seasons, but never became the star some hoped he'd be. Snyder went undrafted in 89 and went back to get his JD degree at Duke. However, in 92, he joined the Clippers staff as an assistant and has been a longtime coach in the decade since. As of 2024, he's working as the head coach for the Atlanta Hawks, but his career includes stints with Missouri, Philly, the Lakers, CSKA Moscow, and the Jazz. Mark Stevenson Stevenson started his college career at Notre Dame. The 6'6 swingman averaged around 10 points during his three years with the school, but in 1988 he was arrested for the second time after being found with alcohol as a minor. He would eventually leave the school and transfer to Duquesne. At the lower level, he averaged 27 points and 6 boards, but doesn't appear to have continued with his basketball career after graduating. I've been unable to find anything more about his post-playing career, so if you know anything, share it below. Irving Thomas Thomas started his career at Kentucky, but mostly came off the bench during his two years with the school. He would then transfer to Florida State and become a starter. He responded with 17 points and 8 boards a night during his senior season. Thomas went undrafted in 1990, but played overseas for a season before getting a contract with the Lakers in 91. He only played in 26 games before heading back overseas until retiring in 1999. Since then, he's been working as a scout for the Lakers, and he seemingly still works there as of 2024. Rodney Walker Walker began his career at Syracuse, but only got around 12 minutes a night during his two years there. He would then transfer to Maryland, but playing time was even harder to come by, though that could have been due to injuries since he only played 21 games over two seasons. After wrapping up his college career, it looks like Walker moved on to lead a relatively normal life. Sadly, he passed away in 2018.